really a chairman and friend for a long, long time. José Manuel de Romarroz, the executive president, Philippe Poton, the ambassadors, the France. Three short previous words. The first, to welcome you to Portugal. You are at home in Portugal. Be welcome in this first Euro African forum. The first one of many, many, many others. Thank you for coming and thank you. A special thank. thanks to the guest speakers, very prestigious guest speakers. And it's so important for us to have you here dialoguing and thinking about the future, the joint future of Europe and Africa. Second word to thank Chairman Durão Barroso and the Executive President, Filipe Oton. Well, it's not easy to start this kind of way, a vital way for both continents. And they did it, and they did it. And I would very much like to thank, in the name of Portugal and of all the Portuguese, for their work preparing this space of dialogue today. Just the first step of many other steps for the future. And the third, to tell you about, to stress the commitment of the Portuguese president and of the Portuguese government in this vital area. Because it's vital for us, the way we see the world, the way we see our relation. It is vital. And as Chairman Barroso said, it's not just an institutional commitment, it's a personal commitment. A personal commitment. Throughout my life, I've been lecturing in uh, Angola, Mozambique, uh, uh, even South Africa, Cape Verde, so many African countries, knowing them for very, very long, and sharing this, not just intuition, but perception of how important it is what we're doing today. Well, let me be uh, pedagogical. I'm a university professor, so in a sense, I had two wonderful speeches prepared, written, you know, by the advisors. Uh, always very interesting, but not as interesting as one statement. Well, first question, what do we want from this forum? We, we want it to be the first of many others. We want it to be an informal forum, not a summit. We have had plenty of summits. Here in Portugal in 2000, 2007, Europe and Africa summits. The, the second one, when Chairman Barroso, Chairman of the European Commission, had already been Prime Minister of Portugal, with his large experience also, with his knowledge of transatlantic ties. And summits are very important. But in this kind of fora, you can speak at ease in an open-minded way. And the dialogue is essential for us. So that's our aim, to start a kind of a long procedure of a dialogue and mutual understanding. That's it, complicity. It's so important, I understood, and most people do not understand it, it's so important, personal complicity. It solves political problems, economic problems, business problems. And on the contrary, if there is no complicity, no mutual understanding, things that appear to be very easy to solve become almost impossible to deal with. Why is it, why Portugal? Why Portugal? Chen Rose explained it. He himself is the example of it because he's in touch throughout his life with many continents, with many economies, with many societies. And we Portuguese are a platform. That's the way we were, we are, will always be. A platform among cultures, civilizations, continents and oceans. It's not by chance that a Portuguese Secretary General of the United Nations. It's not by chance that the Portuguese 
has just been elected Director General of International Migrations Organization. It's not by chance. It's because we build bridges. We can speak with the Africans, with the Asians, with the Americans, and of course with Europeans every day. Uh, well, every day. That's the way we are. That's the reason why Portugal is the place to have this meeting. Is it urgent? It is very urgent. But why? Well, would it be uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago at the time of the summits? I would have said uh, it's important, it's not so urgent. Now that we overcame the two phases, the two post-colonial phases of our mutual relationship, we are entering a new cycle. There was a time, I was by then leader of the opposition in the, in the, in the 90s, in the middle of the 90s, when I heard a well-known and prestigious statesman telling me in a state visit to Portugal, Africa is the lost continent. The diseases, the demographics, the problems. We have so much to do with Americas and Asia and Asia. Well, why Africa? With a few exceptions. Why? And when I tried to explain, he told me he had just spoken with the Prime Minister. By chance, it was Mr. Guterres. And he said, but Mr. Guterres told me the same you were telling me. Yes. Well, you have tried to convince me. No, no. What I'm telling you is just what we think, and he thinks the same. By then, the problem was European arrogance and ignorance of Africa. Many European countries didn't know Africa. They had never been in Africa. They would understand from far away, by the books, by the summits, by the quick state visits. That was all. And trying to explain them what was all about is almost impossible. And on the other hand, there was suspicion, African suspicion, and sometimes rejection. What do they want? At the time of the 2007 summit, there was a kind of uh, proposal of an agreement, and some of African leaders thought, literally, they're not sure what are the intentions of many European leaders. Now we're facing a situation that is more urgent. An account of the state of our relations, an account of the state of the world. The state of our relations, we depend upon one another. Every day, geostrategically, economically, politically, culturally, socially, it's not just about migrations, not just about Mediterranean migrations. It's about the ties we do have and those we still don't have and should have. And it's urgent because in Europe, as Chairman Barrow said, we are entering a very dangerous era. We're coming back to the 30s of last century. We look around and we see xenophobia. We see not only protectionism, but hypernationalism. We see close ways of dealing with the neighbors. We see everything that is the opposite of a free society, of free trade, of free and common understanding. And that's very worrying, because it's not just one case, it's growing every day. Populism, radical populism. It's growing and leading the countries, and leading the countries, not just the kind of uh, opposition parties, opposition in organic movements, no. 
with speaking of governments. We are seeing back what we have seen, and unhappily people do not know history. We have seen almost 100 years ago. It started that way, before the war. But it's worse, because today the world is much more complex than it used to be. And so, to deal with this kind of problem, it's a challenge for you and for us. We must act together. Speaking of investment plans, European positions in Africa, cooperation between Africans and Europeans, we must act together. The only way of stopping populisms is not giving them reasons, social, economic and political reasons to appear and to develop. It's not enough to criticize them. On the contrary, they love that kind of radical fight. They nourish themselves of radicalism. It's the way they grow. And today we have the social nets. We have the TV we didn't have in the 30s. The means of propaganda are more dangerous today and more influential than they used to be. But then there is another reason, not just an European-African reason today, and mostly European, the state of the world. I'm going to tell you how I see the state of the world. Not just as president of Portugal, but as uh, an analyst for decades. We are starting a long, long-term fight about who is going to be the economic center of the world in 50 years' time. Till 1820, it was Asia. It was Asia. We thought, we Europeans, with our empires, we thought we were the center of the world. We weren't. Of course, the United States was not yet the center of the world. It was Asia. With the Industrial Revolution, the first one, the Western countries lost, the, the, won the center of the world, and Asia lost it. And now the dispute is whether Asia is going to recover the trend, multi-secular trend, or we shall have a balanced situation between East and East. When I speak of Asia, I speak of China, of course, but I speak of other Asian powers. And the question is, are they able to convert demographic power into economic power? Will they be able to convert the surplus they have in their relations with Western countries into knowledge? Because the problem for Asia, at least one part of Asia, is knowledge, is innovation, it's science, it's technology. Will they be able either to create it or to buy it from Western countries or not? This is the long-term fight. And this long-term fight could be faced in a multilateral way or in a unilateral way. And happily, there are signs, worrying signs, it will be unilaterally. It's not good news. Because it could start a trade war with protectionism. And this trade war sh could mean just the opposite of a long way to open the markets and to create a free space. It was so difficult to do it. We could go back to the time of the old protectionism in the worst way. And that's the question. You could ask me, what about the former superpower you're not speaking of? This former superpower is nowadays a regional power, a strong regional power, very important for Europe, very important for the Mediterranean, very important for near and Middle East, very important for Northern Africa, of course. No longer, for the moment, being so important in uh, South and Central America, in Africa, and in Asia. This other power could become an objective and tactical ally 
from one of the two powers. The two powers, the one that exists, the other one that is emerging. And now we're coming to the question, oh, what about Europe and Africa? What about us? Shall we be absent in this kind of world, this kind of dispute? And I learned in law, we have a sentence, a French one, that says, les absents ont toujours tort. Those that are absent are always wrong. Because they are no longer important to deal with the problems. For Europe, it's quite a challenge because we should not have splits in Europe. It's enough to Brexit. What we have seen shows that it was enough. Even our American friends that for a while, some of them helped in this kind of fight, are admitting it was wrong. It's a little bit too late. A little bit too late. It was wrong for both of us, for the United Kingdom and for the European Union. Now let us try to find out the way of converting a missed step into a possible understanding. But we don't want more splits in Europe. No. It would be very bad for the United States. It would cost a fortune as it happened now a century ago, very bad for the balance of powers in the world, very bad in this dispute where, it's curious, that the Asian powers are objectively allies at the unity of Europe. It's just an objective alliance, but it is a clever one. Not to create more problems where we have problems enough, and that's why it's so important dialogue, dialogue between Europe and Africa. Because in the middle of this dispute, Africa could be forgotten. Because in the middle of this dispute, Europe and Africa together are much stronger than each one of these continents on, him, on itself. And we should understand it quickly. Because the fighting is going on. Measures today, countermeasures tomorrow, reaction in a month, counterreaction in two or three months. And how to do it? So let us suppose I'm convincing enough to tell that the state of our relations and the state of the world force us to trust each other. It's a question of trust. It's also a question of cleverness and the future. We must be clever. We must be rational. It's enough of ir irrationality. We look around, we just see irrationality. The way people are dealing with the very, very serious problems. And we did it the right way. We started with you. The first forum is with you. With people that know economic and social reality. Because you work on the field every day. You don't have an abstract idea of the situation. So this mixture of entrepreneur, managers, businessmen, and civil service, high ranking, political and effective, responsible actors, it's a, good, a very good mixture. Because we start by the reality. It's where one should start. And this is the first step. Then we need further steps. We must add people from uh, civil society, social leaders, not just economic leaders. Because as one of the subjects you are discussing today says, diaspora is so important. People are migrating. People are creating ties. They are moving. Diaspora is about people, 
common people, not about politicians, not about businessmen, about common people. And another reason why we have populism today is that many politicians forgot about common people. Their message is not understood by common people. There are two worlds, and it's dangerous that one of these worlds chooses to be represented by a populist leader that appears to say whatever people want to listen to. Let us recover and rediscover those links with social movements. So in another forum, we shall put together also other social leaders. And then, of course, we're coming to the, the key question. We need political will. And Chairman Barrow said it, and I do agree fully with what he said. Sometimes we, we university professors, think, wow, we are ha having an educational role for the future. How important we are. Then the businessmen say, no. We are really building the world, because the world is about economics. And the social leaders, some of them, say, no, we are the leaders. Well, and one forgot in the middle of all this politics. And that was a mistake. Populism is also the result of the absence of politics and of statespersons, which is different from politicians. There are thousands of state of, of politicians and of very few state persons. We must rediscover politics. We need political will. It's not enough for an European Union decision to say to solve migration problem, let us create some centers in Northern Africa with the help of, uh, of uh, Northern African countries. Well, that's enough at least until the next summit. <laughs> it's enough for the survival of one or two leaders. It's not enough. <laughs> the problem is there. The problem is there. The problem is economic and social. It's healthcare, it's education. It's the role of the women, the empowerment of women. It's a change, the struggle change. Unless you change it, things won't change. You are working on the surface of the events. You are not really dealing with the causes of the events. Ah, it's hard working. It is. You can't solve it in a summit. No. It requires constant, sustainable political will. Yes. You must believe when you are European in Africa. When you are African, you believe in Europe. And work for it. Every day. So, at the point, we shall need to have political leaders coming to the forum after you, your work. When we have already paved the way, so that it, it's not another photo opportunity. They'll come, very tired, uh, well, uh, saying we have just 30 minutes, yeah, 30 minutes, yeah, no, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. I'm about to take a plane to another meeting, to another summit. Well, which is very much like that. Many of you know it. And it's left, there is a message, a short, better than nothing, a short message left, but that's all. Not the full perception, not the full understanding of the question, not the sustainable political strategy. And finally, and finally, and that could be done at the same time we have in this forum, a youth forum. We need, perhaps, a day before, or at the same time, to involve younger generations. Of course, I look around, I'm very glad because I'm far away, the oldest, the oldest. But it is, uh, it is not future to have someone about to be 70. Just being very young in mind, uh, willing to build these bridges. It's not enough. Not even 60s or 50s. We need the 20s and 30s. When we're speaking of Africa, 
and African demographics, you be the continent is will grow demographically, as you know, which is another economic and social problem, in a way that is not the American or the European, by far, by far, not even the Asian. So, you're dealing with youngsters. Better to involve those youngsters in this kind of dialogue. I don't know how, but you have, as chairman, one of the cleverest persons I've ever met, Mr. Gromberos. So, if he's unable to solve the problem, nobody else will solve it. And, but we should think of it. Every year when I start my classes and I look at my students and they come with new ideas or new ways of uh, just uh, trying to formulate the, the world ideas, the old ideas, I understand that we need to involve them, even to pressurize all the generations. But we did it the right way. First of all, we started and it was tough to start because the classic powers of the state don't like this fora. There is always a kind of envy, of jealousy. Diplomacy loves to have the monopoly of everything, even the informal fora. It's a way of being. It's almost a kind of... Uh, of uh, way of, uh, of surviving. Well, so, in a sense, it was, it was not easy. But we did it. And we did it the right way. Starting with you. And understanding those that are coming from Africa, how unique is this moment? It's unique. Things are going so quickly. If we don't do it now, we will never do it in the future. It's too late. Second, we did it with you. With you. Speaking of reality. Speaking of a 4.0 digital revolution. Speaking of partnerships. Speaking of trust. Speaking of diaspora. Speaking of the subjects. Concrete subjects. And then... We must develop and work. And this first forum will turn into being something even bigger and more important very soon. And it's good for all of us. It's good for all of us. We can still stop many mistakes. Let us not miss this opportunity. Let us not postpone what we have to do today. Let us take advantage of this opportunity. Let us make this step just the first step in a long-lasting future of uh, partnership, of friendship involving Europe and Africa. Thank you.